A very good afternoon to everyone here assembled at the George Street Auditorium and those who are online. Let me welcome you to the annual series of Astro B Watch Lunchtime Lectures. It is my pleasure today to introduce our, our guest speaker, who I will reveal shortly, as you probably know by now. But this uh, wonderful young gentleman has certifications and degrees in the areas of law, political science, sociology, economics, international economic law, and education. He is currently a lecturer in law at the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill, and an attorney at law. He has lectured at top UK universities, the Durham Law School, the School of Oriental and African Studies, and the University College London. He has practiced in international finance and banking law, which included structured products, derivatives, restructuring, and loans, general commercial contract and corporate law, and an offshore law. He came into practice in the debt capital markets in London during the aftermath of the Icelandic financial crisis. The Icelandic crisis occurred when banks became unable to refinance their debts. Three major banks in the Iceland held foreign debt in excess of 50 billion euros, or about 60,000 euros per Icelandic resident, compared with Iceland's gross domestic product of 8.5 billion euros. His early days in practice involve the secondary market trading of loans originated by commercial banks, other similar private debt, and sovereign-backed obligations. He practiced at top-tier international law firms, Ashurst and K&L Gates in London, and offshore at Conyers, Dill, and Pyramon in the British Virgin Islands. He has also worked in-house in the Treasury legal team of the top investment bank Goldman Sachs International in London. He also has experience in trade law, holding a doctorate in international economic law and having worked, published, and lectured in that area. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce to you the President of the Democratic Labour Party, Dr. Ron Yearwood. Thank you, thank you, General Secretary uh, Steve Blackett for that wonderful introduction. I just want to welcome everybody watching here uh, in the room, those online and those uh, in the diaspora to our lunchtime lecture. I, I, I want to really frame this afternoon's lecture as much as it is about the, an assessment of the economy of Barbados some five years since the uh, first election of the uh, Barbados Labour Party. So it's an assessment of where we are as a country, as much as it's about an assessment of them I will also set out some broad terms in terms of where I see uh, the Democratic Labour Party under my leadership taking Barbados. So we'll have a little bit of visioning this evening as well. So, um, so let me just get started by saying, and I want to speak very uh, frontally to this issue, and it's one that concerns me greatly, and it will frame a lot of what I am saying uh, this evening. Uh, and I'm speaking not only to uh, my party, but I'm also speaking more broadly and importantly to the uh, country. And the nature of public debate and discourse that has emerged since the Barbados Civil Party won government in 2018 has been somewhat, uh, if we are honest with ourselves, has been somewhat disturbing. Uh, you know, one has to be presumed uh, innocent, and if I wear my legal hat in this instance, um, until uh, you are proven guilty, um, <clears throat> and there's a burden of proof. What we seem to have in our public discourse, in our public debate, in our public space, is that the government seems to have a free hand uh, where the burden of proof somehow has shifted to the opposition voices as if it's up to those who critique the government to, uh, to, to, to set out the government space, and that cannot be right. Uh, it is the job of the opposition, it is the job of interest groups, unions, churches, everyone to offer critique to the government. That critique can sometimes be followed by solutions, as we have this evening, and at other times that critique may not have direct solutions. And I am urging everyone to understand 
every single critique that you have of the government does not require does not require a uh, does not require a solution. Now, importantly, um, what we have here, therefore, is that everyone begins to sound very neutral. So everyone speaking in the public space, sometimes from radio talk show hosts to um, uh, persons in commerce, persons in the union, everybody's sounding very neutral. Nobody seems to want to offend the government for fear of something, whether that's fear of job, whether that's fear of loss of contract. So what we really have in Barbados is a kind of stifled critique of the government, and we're never getting the true picture of anything. So therefore, our policy and our policy making is really off at the moment. Uh, and, and every criticism um, of, of that, that the government has is followed by you know, other political parties do it. So, so, so you have this emerging kind of, if you like, cascade of stifling. People are being wrapped around um, the government uh, and, and its sycophants. So, and my question is, why does a government which would have 30 seats, you have a popular globe-trotting prime minister, uh, why are you so sensitive and why are you so afraid of what is normal critique? We know the Barbados political space can be, uh, to use kind language, can there be a little bit robust. Uh, we know it can be a little bit rough at times, uh, but over the years in our political life, that robustness, if you like, has served us well because it stops us from making mistakes. It holds us back from the worst excesses of ourselves because the opposition or someone is able to say, you know what, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Leader of the opposition, that is not what you're supposed to be doing. This is the direction of travel that I want, I, I, I want for you. So my question is, do we as a society kind of think so little of ourselves uh, uh, that we believe that no one else has a contribution to make beyond the platitudes of the prime minister and the government? Um, is it that so many of us are, so many of you are dependent on the goodwill, the largesse, uh, you're trying to cover favor, uh, for fear that you just can't offend and are we afraid of the prime minister and this army of sycophants that you see in social media space, that you see in your personal life and your personal space? Um, and dare I say, we have to take back our space because if we build this republic of fear, we cannot have the development that Barbados has always known and that we've always enjoyed. We've always had vibrant public spaces. We've always had robust, and when I tell you, and people who've been in politics for a while, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, they on, you know what I'm talking about. We've always had this very robust public life and this public space. And when the prime minister was opposition leader, she gave the opposition uh, no quarter, she didn't give us a half, she didn't give us a mile, an inch, a centimeter, a millimeter, a microscope of anything. And there I say, future leaders, including myself, we have a right to expect what was given to May Motley should be given to all of us. And if you're gonna judge by that standard, we have a right to critique the government without fair, without favor, and do so in a most robust of fashion that will ensure that we get the best out of our policy making and that we get the best out of our country. And that is just a, what I would say is a warning uh, and a word to the wise. So that just gives a little bit of context to where I wanna go. Uh, I am not about fairy tales and telling interest groups what they want to hear. I am pretty straight talking. I am straight talking to my own party, um, far less uh, uh, anyone else, and, and I will fear no one, especially the Prime Minister or the Barbados Civil Party, because I will do what I think is right. I will do what I think is right by this party and right by this country for the people of this country. Uh, so therefore, sometimes I will say things that are uncomfortable, uncomfortable truths, and uh, so that when I propose the insights and the ideas and I talk about the new economy that I will talk about this evening, uh, we can come to honest propositions about how to build a stronger economy and a better society. Um, often, 
uh, and maybe with some inconvenient truths, people tend to forget that social development costs, it must be paid for. It has to come from somewhere. Uh, and it may be strange for you that a political leader of a party will not come here, I will not come here, and I will not promise you the sky, I will not promise you islands off of Barbados, I will not promise you islands in the sky, I will not promise you free money, I will not promise you the world, I will not promise you bags of gold, I will not promise you anything in this meta or the real universe. The reality is that we must have discipline, fiscal discipline in our country, and we must have economic discipline. We have to start coming to grips with how we will pay for the things that we want to enjoy, where the money will come from, and how we will earn that money. We cannot continue to be beggars, and that must stop. So, social and economic development are intrinsically tied to each other. So there must be a, sensual, a, a kind of sensible realization, if you like, or rebalancing um, of how we are. Because the reality is you cannot be everything to all men or women, and you end up being nothing. And in some ways, that is where this current government finds itself trying to be everything to everyone, but ends up doing nothing for anybody but for themselves. So developing a new economic vision or pillar or idea or concept or whatever you want to label it must be strategic. It has to be in some ways measurable, so we'll, we'll come to that, has to be clear and it has to go from policy to people because at the end of it all, whatever we do, Barbadians have to implement it. It doesn't matter what fancy things I may get up here and tell you or we can design in this room. I am sure I could lock everybody in this room and we could come up with a, a, a policy framework for Barbados because there are enough bright people here, enough bright people in this country. That's not the problem. Coming up with the frameworks aren't the problem, but it is how do we rally the entire country to be able to implement whatever we discuss in spaces like this. Um, and I think sometimes that's the missing element. So, my speech here will really be in three parts. Uh, I will set up a very candid picture of the economy and where we are. That's the first part. Remember, if I said we can't develop a new economy if we don't have a true picture of where we are. The second part will set out what I think are some insights for what a new economy could look like and where we can earn going forward. And the third, the third bit is that connection to people that I'm talking about. So how do you connect this new economy to the people and what are some of the tests or the measures that you can, you can put in place? So, so basically, when we think about Barbados, Barbados has a very, very simple, if you like, problem. Um, and we spend more than we earn. That's why we have deficit. There's no rocket science to it. There's no, there's no magic. We're simply spending more money than we make. And if you spend more than you make, you got a deficit. So you got debt. You got to get the money from somewhere to pay for the things that we want to pay for. So the ways to address that, you have to borrow, you have to earn, there has to be tax or a combination of those three things. So what I want to do then is to, to make a point really about the, the, the current, if you like, the current state of the, um, current state of the economy, and I'm going to go through five, five things uh, that talks about the economy five years on from where we are. So let's, let's rewind and let's go back to 2018 or just before 2018. We know that we were on the line before then by a global financial crisis. We faced deep and serious crisis in terms of our public finances, uh, foreign exchange reserve, those sorts of things. We entered into an IMF program, uh, and there has been some improvements on that side of things in terms of public finances and the foreign exchange reserves, albeit from borrowing. But the reality is those numbers have gone up, and that has secured and stabilized that aspect of the economy. Um, and I, I would be somewhat uncharitable not to make that point. You know, as I said, I, I, I like to think that we're doing politics differently. So that's fine. You can, you can say, OK, you know what? You did good there. But then you can also say where you didn't do well. And that is what this is about. Um, so we acknowledge the problems. We acknowledge the improvements. And what I will say, and I want this, and I want this to be very clear, is that a, 
DLP, Iran Year with Love DLP, commits itself to strict adherence to modern public finance management and practices and metrics. And they will be disciplined under a Democratic Labour Party government when it comes to the public finances. We have to understand that is something we need to get right. It is something that we have to project to the public. And I commit myself as leader of this party to ensuring we will do all that we can to reflect that discipline in public finances and public spending going forward. That's one. Now, how do we go about doing that? What kind of commitments can we use to signal to Barbados, to signal to the international community, to signal to those and our partners in the multilateral institutions, to signal to the markets that we are serious about this commitment. I would commit to anchoring the public finance uh, within the international accepted framework and benchmark of debt to GDP ratio of 60%. What I will argue here and what is different between the Democratic Labour Party and the Barbados Labour Party is how do we get to that and what does that require and what is the current government doing that I will not do? Because often everybody likes to say all parties are the same, they're doing the same thing. That is also not true. And I hope by the end of this lecture, you were able to differentiate between a Democratic Labour Party led by myself and the current Barbados Labour Party and what the future under each of those particular governments would look like and to recognize it is not just about personality, but at its core, there are deep philosophical differences about how we govern this country, even if we can agree on some of the metrics in terms of public finance here, saying, for example, I commit to the debt to GDP ratio of 60%. So that is a signal to our international partners, that's a signal to the mar markets, that is a signal to uh, the agencies of where we would be going. However, you cannot get there via a tax and spend approach uh, with no clear idea of growth, and that is essentially what we're getting from the uh, Barbados Labour Party government. So that's one thing. Second thing here is that the improvements in public finances, and we realize I just talked about, I said, you know, let's come in, give a take. There were improvements in public finances and foreign exchange reserves since 2018, but how were they achieved? Let's analyze that. You can give somebody a point, but then you can break it down. How were those things achieved? Those things were achieved through what? Borrowing. That's problematic. So even though you stabilize the public finances for the books, the achievement was through borrowing, which has created other problems in other parts of the economy. And it was not only through borrowing, but the achievements were through measures that have reduced the level, uh, the standard of living of many Barbadians. So, and the main, major area of expenditure uh, reduction has been through debt restructuring which hurt many people and it hurt the financial institutions. We've been over this. We know that the credit union lost millions of dollars. We know that pensioners lost millions of dollars. We know lots of people lost millions of dollars. We are trying to build back confidence within uh, our local uh, uh, debt market and our local bond markets. So, and we know that Barbadians has been, how to put this? Barbadians has had to face, that's the kind way of putting it, uh, a series of taxes and levies, some 30 and rising. I'm not going to go through all of them, increase in bus fare, we had the pandemic levy, we had garbage and sewage tax, we had the health service levy, we have increases in gases, we had the child uh, tax allowance eliminated, but yet you're talking about growing your population and supporting people to get more children, makes no sense. We had tax on Airbnb, yet you're talking about creating new entrepreneurs and trying to help them out uh, in terms of a uh, 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 being part of this gig economy and the new economy. Uh, we have a health service levy, we have stamp duty, we had room rate levy, commercial water rates, and on and on and on and on. And recently, we had levy increases at the QEH, despite the no tax budget. We had levies in terms of alternative vehicles, and we know that gas just went up again. So, on and on and on. So, that, that gives us a picture of our current um, of our current, current uh, situation. 
uh, Ranier would let DLP be focused on improving public finances, but not constantly trying to eat into your pockets. Because that's the difference, and that has to be that. There has to be a difference of approach. If I'm trying to improve the public finances, but I'm doing so on the back of the middle class, and I'm doing so on the back of uh, poor Barbadians, that in the end does not help. So the books and the records are going to look good. So, you, so you're going to get glowing praise for the IMF about good job. You're you're meeting the BERT targets, and everything is going well, and and we are on the we are on the road. To, to, to recovery, but the reality is that recovery then is not translating to the real relive experience of people. So, so there's, there's, a, there's a disconnect. So, and I'm not sure sometimes the government recognizes that. And they're like, oh, people ain't, ain't, people ain't being thankful for what we're doing. It's like, how can you be thankful? Because you're building your image, your global image on my back. Literally, you are dining out on my back. So, so there, there, there is a problem. There's a problem there. So, so there, there's obviously a disconnect in their heads because they can't seem to to see it. So, what we have to do, we have, and everybody talks about it. We have to find creative ways to grow the economy. We have to generate more high-paying jobs, and we have to have inclusive growth uh, instead of wealth circulating among a few friends and handouts to keep people on board. And this is something I want you to bear in mind, the difference between commercial activity and economic activity. So you see in the paper lots of things like, oh, we're building this. Last week, I thought the newspaper was an ad for the Barbados Labour Party's uh, infrastructure development projects. Got every single page, a new building come on, on board, $100 million investment, $200 million. That is not economic activity, that is commercial activity. There's a difference because that activity will benefit a few people. That activity is not necessarily an economic driver. You're not creating new industries. You're not creating new centers of learning. You're not connecting the parts of the economy, that tourism, that are disconnected from agriculture and technology. You're not doing that. You are building buildings to create short-term boosts in work and employment and to get a headline to say that there's investment but that investment is not flowing through all of the facets of the economy so let us keep that in mind the difference between commercial activity and engagement and economic activity are two very different things two two very different things now david Thon third thing here david thompson used to say that barbados is more than the economy it's a society and I would add to that, and I would suggest that Barbados is more than public finances and foreign exchange reserves, which this government loves to brag about. But I charge that the government has failed miserably in the management of the wider economy. And it's, a, it's such an interesting contradiction when you think about it. You know, they're, they're out there doing really like, well, oh yeah, the foreign reserves are the best we've had in the history of this country. But how are those best foreign reserves helping Cheryl, who live in Hearts Gap, that got three children to send school? How are those foreign reserves helping Adrian, who live in uh, uh, Bosco Bell, that's trying to start his small business? How are those foreign reserves helping Jeff, who uh, helping out with his church group, taking part C pension to keep somebody and feed a family. How are those reserves helping John, who's now starting university? Or Anne, who just graduated from university? So I, I, I hope you're trying to see here. So you can have excellent public, public finance metrics and a really poor economic management. And that, that's exactly what we have now. Because those things do not filtering down to help and improve the lives of Barbadians. And the only reason that you want the, 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 that the things should be doing well on one side is that they're filtering down to help ordinary Barbadians and Barbadians who are just trying to live out their, their lives. So where are we in terms, we have to look at the debt. Now, our economy remains unbalanced and dependent on tourism. We know that tourism is our biggest earner in terms of the economy. In fact, many of the projects that we've talked about, that we've heard about, will only further entrench 
that dependency because we're not creating the kind of learning society and the kind of economy that will get us to the future. Does that mean we abandon tourism? No. We don't abandon tourism in the short to medium term, but that means that we have to use tourism in order to pivot to other spaces. Now, I want to pull up um, a chart, chart, chart one. Uh, those, at, those at home, um, those not watching online will be able to see it, but I'll, I'll talk you through it. So, our debt problem. So, what is the fundamental issue with Barbados? We have a debt problem. We are literally stuck in second gear. We are literally in, if we're not already in, we are very close to a debt trap. So, in 2017-18, debt was $14.8 billion. That's just a fact. There's no point fighting up about that. I know the government talks about it being 18 billion and, and 20 billion and all sorts of things. That's lies. I'm telling you right now. Because they're trying to in, they're trying to put arrears into the debt figures, and that's not the measurement. Pure debt, this is when we go to central bank reports, it is $14.8 billion, 2017-18. Now, for all the magic and the um, the, 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 the bragging and the bravado and the, the chest pumping and Barbados is back and we're punching above our way and mission 2030. Do you know how much debt is today? $14.2 billion. $14.8 billion. $14.2 billion. Now, external debt 27, 2018, 3.1 billion. How much is the external debt today? 5.1 billion. Domestic debt in 2017, 2018 was 11.7 billion. Today, domestic debt is 9.1 billion. The sinking fund, which is used to settle some debts in 2017, 2018, was 600, 600 million. Today, it is 31 million. So, so what we have and what the figures and what the data is telling us so far, if we have to uh, assess where we are, the restructuring has not changed the debt. The restructuring has moved the debt. So instead of having high ex um, in domestic debt, we now have high external debt debt. So that's a, that's a problem within itself because you know, like if you want to talk to the external debt creditors and beg for a little, a little, a little um, reprieve. So here, here, here's what we know and here's, here's a summary of where we are for the five years of this government so far. We're not earning enough. Restructuring has sifted the debt, not necessarily change it. External debt is rising. Um, and there's also a link between what I will call the growth challenge and productivity. And we're going to get to that. We're going to come, we're going to come to that in a, um, in a minute. So we have a debt problem. So despite all the lot of long talk, despite all the talk about borrowing money and all these things, what has the money done? So has your garbage collection improved? No, not really. Has your bus service improved? Eh, not really. Uh, hospital service improved? Worse. Uh, clinics? Eh. School plants? Probably just as random, if not worse. So, so we have this situation where we've borrowed all of this money, but there's no delivery of services. So that points to, really, the only logical conclusion when you go from A to be incompetence. Because you can't say you didn't have the money because you borrow enough. So where is the money going? How are you using the money to deliver the things that you promised that you were going to deliver? So we, we are faced with a government that is essentially uh, incompetent. Now, the fourth thing we have to, 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 to acknowledge is that economic and social policy do not seem anchored in any philosophy. They do not seem, by this government, 
anchored any deep thinking or ideas or are trying to come up with new visions or it seems simply anchored in a prime minister a leader who is in a hurry and a search for a legacy and a desire to simply replace Arobaro. How very sad. So you have, as a result, all the policy iterations are rushed, poorly given, they're not thought out, and then they don't meet the needs of the drawing board. Every single major policy announcement of this government, they've had to retreat sometimes to not come forward with it again, or they retreat to come back with it again two, three times at it. That is not how you do policy. From the ID cards, well, we now we don't even know again now with the ID cards. The, 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 the houses that were supposed to be built for the, for the hurricane victims, the Mr. Get House, the house that the guy received keys for in St. Andrew, but actually ain't got the house. So, so you did that for a photo op to the, to the, to the social uh, child protection uh, policy that you just unveiled in Parliament as a minister, and then you had the gall to get up in Parliament and say, yeah, yeah but it, 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 it's, not, it's not finished, and we're going to try to finish it um, within, within, within a group, and we're going to discuss it. So why you move the bill in the first place? If you know the bill is not adequate, it's not ready, why are you bringing it to the floor of Parliament? It makes no sense. All Hayat Higher Hindu, the fire station delayed. You just spent millions of dollars in flood prevention in Spikestown. That work. Old Town, you spent millions on the road repair, and then you had to spend millions to patch it back up afterward. So you have this reoccurring theme of incompetence. So how do we how do we get out of that? I am going to try to paint a way forward. I'm going to try to set out some ideas and initiatives of what a new economy in Barbados could be built on, sketching it out for you, and then how do we engage people to be part of that, um, to be part of that economy. So let me commit to say that the current administration has sought to fund our social services and our development, and it's not sustainable through a massive debt restructuring and a program of heavy taxation. When you break it down, that's it. There's no creativity, there are no new ideas, the new industries that they've toyed with have failed. Anybody hearing him with the marijuana industry recently? Go on. So let me say this. I do not, and I categorically say, I do not approve of debt restructuring as a sovereign tool supports in Barbados. So, so let me put it this way. Maybe I am a little bit old-fashioned, but I think that, and I grew up in country, so maybe it's a country thing. When you borrow people money, you just do what? Pay you pay it back. Now, I am told that those who are wealthy may think differently. So you have a situation where the current leader, prime minister of Barbados, is effectively calling for another restructuring of the foreign debt of Barbados. I hope y'all, let's put it in context. So we had a debt restructuring when this government came into power. Correct. You went out, you borrowed lots of loans, you came back, you bragged, they were 1%, 2%. That turned out to be a fallacy because the loans are, are variable. That means the loans have gone up. That means that some of the percentages that you're now paying, you're paying 150 million extra on top of everything. Now, Prime Minister may not understand what she's doing, but if she's out there now going, and you saw the, um, the interview, what was it, at the Rockefeller Center, um, saying, oh, you know, I want you to help, help me adjust the, um, the, the, the floor and the ceiling, because, you know, we want a little ease. That's a debt restructuring. You're literally asking for another debt restructuring because those were not the terms you signed up to. And I've worked in debt capital markets. So the first thing you do when you're going to a loan, you got something called a term sheet. It's real easy. It's got the amount, the years, the interest rates, where it's coming from, uh, conditions for this loan, usage. This is just normal stuff. 
So how then do you pretend that you didn't recognize the rates were available? No, you just get caught out because you didn't think that they can move. But then that tells me again that you're really incompetent because weren't you tracking the Fed to know that interest rates were rising for the, well, every single announcement for the Fed for the last 10 times interest rates were going up. It was obvious that they were moving. Everybody could see that. Doesn't take anybody with special training to recognize that. So you obviously know what you're doing. But now you're effectively out there begging for another debt restructuring after you have the first debt restructuring. So you're literally trying to use debt restructuring as a long-term economic financial management tool, and it is not. That's not the purpose of debt restructuring. If you are running your house, what does debt restructuring do? It provides you with the what? A ease so that you can get on and do the other things that you're supposed to do, like get that new job. Like get the business going. Debt restructuring is just a little, a little break. A temporary break so you can fix the normal things and get going. But that restructuring, you just have to constantly restructure your debt. That, that, it, it, it cannot work as a long-term solution. And what it does it affects investor confidence. So literally, the... the uh, the bottom of the bucket fell out of the local debt, uh, debt market. And we know nobody won't buy the boss bonds. Yeah, the couple of banks and whoever came forward, for whatever reasons they may have had to do so, but normal citizens are buying the bonds. Nobody trusts government. We do not trust them enough. And, that's, and, that, and that, that trust, that, that distrust that we have in terms of bonds is earned. That I want the bonds later? Not, not, not in this current state. So, effectively, we need a growth strategy. We need to effectively manage our public services. And we have to have a hard conversation. We're not necessarily going to do that today. But this is a signal for, for the kind of conversations that I want us to take as a country. We have to have a hard, com a time when I'm going to talk a few uncomfortable truths, a hard conversation as a country about what our reform will do in terms of the services that we want to keep. What are the things that we want to protect for Barbadians for the now and the future, and how can we afford to keep doing them? These are serious conversations, you know. You can't keep dodging these things. You can't keep pretending that everything is okay. And effectively, that is what we have in the current prime minister. Someone who obviously lives in a fairy tale land, someone who obviously is not living the lived and real experience of Barbadians in terms of being able to afford things, and someone who obviously thinks that you can walk into a place, take up what you want, and don't pay for it. But I know the way I grew up, when I walk into the store, I had to put down that money and pay for it. Because that's just the way it worked. But I friendly country. So our brains may be different expectations, philosophies, moral compasses, the things that you hold true to your true north that tells you borrowed money has to be paid back. Whether it's individually or as a country, we have to take responsibility for the fact that we borrow these monies. We have to take responsibility that we cannot spend our lives begging. And maybe the Prime Minister will not listen to me. Maybe she will not um, listen to voices, uh, other opposition voices. But she might listen to her friend, the President of Ghana, Ado, um, who told Africa recently, y'all need to stop begging, though. Get one out together. Get the services together. Get the economy growing. Stop begging. So she might not hear me, but she might hear her... Um, her African brother. And the message is we must stop begging. But then the Prime Minister may have always had a funny relationship with money, especially other people's money, which is our money. Because any relationship that she has with money, any of her money, that's the money that you be spending. That's the taxes that I pay. That's my pandemic levy. That is my, um, my sewage tax. All of those things are the taxes that I pay in order to try to create this sustainable, uh, beautiful society that we, that, we, that we currently live in. Now, so 
that was just to give you a sense of where we are in a part one. Now, so set up the problems, I'll tell you what's going on. This is a true picture of where we are. How do we get out of this? Do we get out of it next month, next year? No. What I'm talking about is something long term, but I'm talking about we have to start positioning ourselves to get there. So what does it mean when I talk about um, the new economy? What does it mean when I talk about uh, service zones? What does it mean do I talk about new earners? And what those new earners are, what the challenges that we're going to face, and let me explain this and put a little bit of context, the new economy that we have to create in Barbados has addressed the growth challenge and the productivity challenge. So, uh, if you can bring those slides for those at home. There's a slide two, growth challenges. So between 81 and 2021, 20, uh, Barbados has had 15, I want, you to, I, want you to, I want you to hear this, 15 years of real GDP decreases. 26 of real uh, GDP increases. So when you look at the league table of growth within the Caribbean, we are at the bottom. Somehow we like to think that we be punching above the wig and we are we at the bottom. If we want to create the society that we like and we want to enjoy, we have to move up that table. So give me a, let me give you an example of a country that's at the top of the table. Dominican Republic. Guess how many Guess how many year, real, uh, years of real GDP decreases they've had? Four. That, that's the kind of thing that we gotta, that we gotta produce. Belize, four. Mauritius, one. St. Kitts, they've had uh, seven. St. Lucia, 10. Dominica, 10. Bahamas, 10. Singapore, four. So the countries that we may need to emulate it's a simple thing. They just get more years of growth. We, on the other hand, we are with Trinidad, 15 years of real GDP decreases. Every other country in the top, top tier is having between one, and I would say, let's say one and nine or 10 years of real GDP decreases to achieve and to pay for the things that we want. So we have a growth challenge. We also have, um, if you go to the next slide, a productivity challenge. We also have a productivity challenge. So productivity in Barbados fell off in about early 90s. Early 90s, somehow, we start being productive. So our independence period was the most productive period of Barbados. Some of the estimates, as, uh, the analysis estimate that three quarters of all the growth, so you may talk about any decreases just now, three quarters, and then go back to the growth, three quarters of all the growth that we've had in this country to build all these things that we see occurred in that independence period. And it occurred on the our borough. In, 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 in it's an interesting context. There are reasons for it. We were growing the economy. We were establishing new things. Obviously, you can get growth. All those things have to be taken in context. But the point is, the majority of our growth occurred at one period, and then by the mid-90s, we were just, we were almost managing decline. From then to pretty much now. Countries that have been doing well, when you go back to the same uh, Dominican Republic productivity through the roof. So we've got a growth challenge, we've got a productivity challenge, we've got a debt challenge, and currently add to that, we've got an issue of competence with the government. So how do we even get out of this? What do we have to do in order to create this new Barbados and to create the space that we want for our country. So, one of the things that I have talked about this for years, anybody who's following me can probably be a little bit bored. 
But we have to treat government. Government has to start to behave as if business and social enterprise. What does that mean? It means that we have to find, government has to create ways to open spaces for job development and for jobs. Government can use its levers to open spaces for people to create businesses and to create jobs. Everybody can be employed by the government. Everybody can get a government pick. It can't happen. So if everybody can't get a government pick, where are they going to be employed? They have to be able to create their own businesses. That business is either here or that business is somewhere else. They're living here, but they're earning globally. So I, I use a phrase, I, I, I borrow it from a friend, and I see he's there smiling. They can live locally, earn globally. And that's where we have to pitch. That's where we're going. Or even if you're living here and earning locally, you are not necessarily a government employee because government can employ everyone. That's just the reality. We could pretend to, but it can't. So what other areas can we create employment in? We can, and this is something I've talked about, service zones. What is a service zone? How do we, how do we kind of uh, rocket boost our, 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 our financial sector and our international um, business sector? And how do we create new spaces for new jobs? Now, a service zone is not simply trying to repeat um, early pre and post industrialization by invitation and the exclusive economic zones uh, that we had, which like tourism can contribute to economic growth, but do not contribute to economic development. Realize there's a difference there. Because there's no technology transfer, there's no innovation. You're not creating a learning economy when, you, when, you, when, you're, in a, when you're a tourist-based economy. So tourism can create the ability to pay for things, because you get foreign exchange, but there's no transfer of knowledge. We know this. There's no innovation. There's usually sometimes no linkages, because half the things you want to support the industry, you end up importing, so you're taking the same foreign exchange to, to, to drive the industry. So right now, there are people asking the question, is tourism actually contributing to our economic development? Ser serious question. And they're trying to go through the deal, is tourism worth it? That's a serious question. That's something we have to think about. But for now, let's park it. So what is a service zone? We're talking about a physical space. We're talking about centers. We're talking about hubs that can support finance, banking, tech, shipping, arbitration. They've done something like this in Dubai. The International Financial uh, Center, which is the financial free zone, it's a financial hub for the Middle East, Africa, South Asia, or the Shanghai uh, Free Zone and Arbitration Center. You can pull up the next slide. So what is it required to set up a service zone? It requires a set of laws to govern the behavior of the people of businesses in and outside of the zone. And importantly, what you need to do, and this is my, my legal hat on here, you are literally creating a legal space or a system by which an economic system can develop around. Because that's all it is. You're just creating rules by which everybody can behave in that space. So what do you need to get it? Properly designed incentive packages for mature businesses and startups. So you're not simply trying to give people tax breaks, exorbitant tax breaks, alerting to Barbados to dig out the eye, met money, ship it out somewhere else, and we still don't benefit, and claim my empl I employ 50 people. So I'm doing something for Barbados. No, you're not. A business has to employ people. I don't know why we just brag, or oh, the business employ people. But obviously you have to. Who gonna work? The ghost? Somebody got you gotta employ somebody. So that is not something to brag about. My business employs 50 people. I've come to Barbados and I've employed 50 people. So we're supposed to give you the country, the keys, the kingdom, and everything because you got employ 50 people? No. So the incentive packages have to be realistic to the kind of Barbados that we want to create. 
Now, so it's not simply about giving you tax breaks and exorbitant tax breaks because you are going to come and then we're going to put it in a, in a brochure. Barbados has um, international firm A, B or whatever and you know, we're, we're doing well. And then when you drill down, yeah, they employ 50 people, they don't really pay the tax. Cooperation tax, you reduce from 30% to base rates of 1%. So the main paying the taxes, uh, but you're going to put it in a glossy magazine because you want to look like you're attracting business to Barbados. But how are they benefiting this country? They do not. That's the problem. Now, the development of large-scale projects must be tied to the development of the social capital of this country. So if you are coming here and you want to build a Hyatt, what are you doing for Bridgetown? Which school that you going to sponsor? What is the private public sector partnership that will develop to ensure that you start funding a school within your environs? Which labs you paying for? Which roads are you going to pave in the communities around and to your businesses? What community centers will you be building in your area? This is how we have to start thinking about development. You just can't come here and bulldoze a space, build a big high rise, do you think, make you money. The communities around you are in the same spaces. The schools around you have not improved. You have not contributed to the social capital or developing country. 10, 20 years later, you build a rundown, you pack out your briefcase, pack out your profits, and you go along with your business. And you left and you leave us there holding the bag. The politicians who bragged about creating 100 jobs, $200 million in investment. I'd I, I just be bewildered when I start talking, you know. Yes, we are doing so well. How? It has to stop. We have to start getting serious about what kind of development do we want for Barbados. Yes, nobody against foreign investment. Of course, come to Barbados. Of course, build whatever you need to build that is in, in congruence with our laws and our, and our development of our country. But how are you tied in to the development of the country? And that is the way that international investment in national development is going. That is what you're talking about when you talk about good corporate social citizens. All that has to be tied in. So social service zones aren't necessarily about building new edifices of concrete. You can use existing brownfield um, sites. And some of the other things that we can do with these zones, you can create arbitration hubs, shipping hubs, logistic hubs. You can offer professional services, attract new businesses, attract new investments to Barbados. You can use it as a space to test financial products, um, build out blockchain or all the technologies that you want, electronic contracts, all of these things. You can allow English and New York law to be used. For example, Service Zone could provide for um, a Shanghai arbitration center so that there's arbitration disputes that can take place governing Chinese law. We could be a first. There's no point pretending that China is not a major development partner of the Caribbean and that China is not a major economic power of the world. So how do we how do we leverage that relationship to benefit us, not to disadvantage us? Are there disputes that will be happening within the region with Chinese investments? Of course there will be. Could there be an outpost of an arbitration center in the Caribbean to handle those disputes in the place? Yes, we can do that. The point is, Barbados could possibly be a hub for development for in the Caribbean, Latin America, for investment as it relates to China. Service zones have potential to be the next thing. Because what they can do also is that they can create that learning society that tourism did not create. They can be a hub to do all the things, attract financial businesses, logistics, arbitration, tech, and you have them sitting neatly in the center. We can find creative ways to create that new economy to drive the development of this country and to pay the bills for the things that we like. So, so what are the key, the key um, things in creating this ecosystem? Tax and investment incentives, community investment, simplified customs, planning, because you, you don't want to use greenfield sites, 
integration into economic areas such as renewables and agriculture, and important, I can't keep stressing this, it creates that learning society. Because if you are coming here and you're setting up businesses and you're doing things, there has to be knowledge transfer. We cannot simply be getting the lowest paced jobs at the bottom of your investment profile. We have to be part of middle and upper management of these companies. We have to be learning things. Because we have to do things. And none of this in you. I don't understand. Sometimes we've been talking about this since the 80s. And we seem not to be able to do anything because we fall back on platitudes and politics. Making big promises which we know we cannot keep in order to simply get a vote. And then when it's done, everybody disappointed. The voter is disappointed. Nothing happened. The boy ain't doing nothing. You, the, 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 the government, probably disappointed because you don't understand what they can't be grateful. But what they can be grateful for? You ain't doing nothing. So we can create these service zones as a new pillar of the economy. They can be a vehicle for international business. They can give it a boost. Tourism can continue. But the future has to come in finding ways that bring investment to drive the development of this country. And not only bring investment, but create homegrown opportunities for investment. So recently I saw, I saw something. This is not to knock it about a rum factory uh, coming to Barbados. I like, wait, wait, wait. You telling me nobody in Barbados can set up another rum factory? Nobody, but here on, we just drink enough of it. I was sure we know to make it. Nobody here could have set up a rum factory? No, you tell me that there's nobody here that could get together, get the right investment packages together, get some investors, get the bank, maybe a little uh, underwriting by the government for a certain percentage to sell it and got some stability and to set up this rum factory. Why are we thinking we always need to depend on something outside? And they ain't gonna do nothing special. They're gonna buy an old plantation, they're gonna retrofit it, put the, uh, the vats in, the tanks, bring in some barrels, slap a label on it, um, you know, special rum connoisseur in the fields and hills of Barbados. You can get a video, beautiful flowing music. You can see some canes and uh, maybe a few smiling people. And they can sell that at premium, make enough money, employ some people. Yes, of course, they're employing some people. But how are we benefiting? How, how have we become wealth creators and wealth generators? We still just in the field, though. I talk in Frank. We ain't own nothing. We still depending on somebody else. All of these projects that you see, are you telling me there is no one competent and capable here? Every job you open the paper, somebody coming in, what you tell? So why all this education? You tell me nobody can be an accountant? Nobody can be a beverage service food manager? Nobody know to be a wine connoisseur. Uh, we just call it a sommelier. Not oh, every day opening paper. It's ridiculous. How does that create a learning society? And then people leave, and we wonder why they're leaving. So, and importantly, this is the, the last bit. Um, so I'm getting there. The last bit of this presentation is that I want to talk about some development tests. So if you're going to create a new basis for economic and wealth generation because you want people to own their economy, to drive the country, there has to also be, there also has to be a way to test that. So there has to be a certain series of questions that every single set of investment should have to pass. So for example, does the investment make local landowners part of the project to benefit directly, financially, or from shares in the profit? So the people that live in Bridgetown, that live in Nelson Street, and cross there by, um, by Bay Street, any of them got investments in Hyatt? They gonna benefit? They might ask them to come in and want to work them as maids and cleaners, but they're going to benefit from Hayat. 
then got shares in that? Did anyone think, okay, how many people live in the environs? Okay, we, this will be a major part of a project in your neighborhood. Are there ways to integrate you within the development of this project? All right, can we give you a percentage? Say, you know, I just want an arbitrary number. Let me set aside 5%, split it up among you. You know, every, every year, whatever you get, premium, a couple hundred dollars. You gotta start thinking, people. You gotta start thinking about wealth creation, generational wealth. Anybody think about that? Any of these projects that are built, do anybody in the areas own something or part of them? Have they been asked? Have you invited them? Have you talked to them about how to create the packages? I mean, you can probably be a man, they ain't got the money, but you gotta help. You gotta create the ladder. Now, the second question for any project, does it contribute to the socio-economic development of Barbados? In simple terms, does it help to pay for uh, social services, such as education and health. So our, our thinking about projects has to go beyond, when you, hear the, when you hear a minister announce a project and he said 100 million and 50 jobs, ask the next question, that's base thinking. Of course, it gotta create jobs and it gotta be an investment. What is the next step? Is that project contributing to paying for education and, 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 and health? Outside of taxation, are you talking about have they, have they entered into some kind of partnership with a local school? Have they entered into a partnership with a local clinic? Have they entered a partnership with a community center? Have they identified, okay, you know what? I've got 10 rows around Nelson Street that I want paving, hot scat thing. Okay, I can pay five. All right, that's my contribution to, to social welfare and capital of this country. And then I can go into a contract, I'll be responsible for these five rows for the next 10 years or something. That's pressure off the government. Because you just can't, it's not just about you making money, filling your profits and your, and your, and your books, and then you flying out to Barbados and doing well, but all the services and things around these spaces pop down, people ain't living proper lives, and you're creating a have and a have not to say, that cannot work, and I will not have it not in this country. Not but here, somebody says. <laughs> the other question, does the project or the investment contribute to infrastructural development of Barbados? So again, as we're saying, do they ensure surrounding housing, community centers, parks, roads are upgraded, all these things? Does the project provide for economic empowerment of Barbadians? This is not simply, as I said, about providing jobs and bragging about a provider job, but what type of jobs? How do these jobs pay? You got people in the tourism sector, as we heard last week from, 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 from one of our colleagues, making $1,700, $1,500 a month, but they were bringing somebody in the same job and getting $20,000, a car, tuition for the children at a private school. And a, a, a trip every year back to home. Same job, but they're gonna pay the local person $1,500 or $1,700 a month, and that person has a family to feed. Barbadians must have opportunities to create and grow existing businesses, not only gain employment. I think the government's talking about, about employment as if that is something to, 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 to always check. Where are the other things? You create jobs, yes, but what are the other things you're doing? How are these people getting wealth? How are they able to then create another generation of their family that will not be dependent on government for handouts? They then will be able to help somebody else. How are they then not going to own not only the mother house, but going to be able to create another house? How are they then not only be able to, to not only go and have a first degree, but their children might be able to do a master? It's always the next level. Their parents might have $50,000 in the bank account. They should have 100. They should got less. Everything has to... In so investment and creation of a new economy cannot simply be about job creation. That's one aspect. The most basic of aspects, it has to go beyond that. Has to lift, we gotta lift the game. So, does the project, another test, create, provide for wealth creation opportunities for Barbadians 
in that these projects and these investments have to buy goods, they have to procure their goods and services from small to medium-sized businesses in Barbados. The government promised this. What, 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 how much they promised that, that the government should buy um, goods and services from small, and they don't do it? Furthermore, the register that they were supposed to set up to let me know who the contract's going to, well, they then set up. We ain't got the transparency there. So millions, we still don't know where these contracts are going. We were promised it. We were promised integrity law. Still it happened. So all of these are the kind of things that we have to start thinking seriously about in terms of pushing this country forward. So what is the way forward? Service zones, support the development through the outline of businesses, uh, to define the zones, tax and customs incentives, and how to measure it, ensure that the developments are not only for that project, but for the wider economy. And you have the government behaving as a business and a social enterprise and not as a victim. We can't guilt the West into helping us. We, it is time, yes, we understand the history, we know what happened, we can fight for reparations. That's a separate debate. But we also have to recognize that if our country is going to change, we have to be the drivers of that. The productivity challenge that I just talked about, that is we do. Why we fall off? Why we ain't producing? That is us. That nobody outside of Barbados. That is a, that's an issue that we have to mount. The growth challenge, that's an issue we have to mount. Why are, are is Mauritius and Singapore and Belize and all these other countries, St. Louis, why are they growing and we are not? Why are we at the bottom of lead cables for growth? Why are we having more looking, pushing more years of non-growth than years of growth? The government talks about 10% economic growth, but that's a fallacy. I wish we would start telling the truth. We know the 10% that we're going to get, and then the 4% that, uh, that they predicted um, this, this year, we know that that barely makes up for the last five years. So technically, we have not had growth for the last five years. The Barbados economy is probably no more than 1, 1.5% larger than when this government took office. That's just the reality. If you tell the truth, then at least you might be able to figure somewhere out of it. Stop trying to pretend and load the statistics as if, as if they're real. There's no way that that in a, unemployment number could be true. But when you're pretending, you're not helping anybody. That doesn't help the country. You have to be honest with the country. The very way that I'm honest with this party, sometimes people give me lashes for it, but that's me. I can be honest with the country. I ain't here to tell you all the lies. You have to then make the decision as to, wait, this, this man telling me the truth. Okay, all right. This, this is something that I could get involved in. This looks like a direction that I, that I can take, that I can, that I can be part of. So I want to leave you with this, and it's something that, that over the coming months, over the coming uh, year or so, that I will, that I will definitely develop and work on. I want to leave you with the five things that I will keenly be looking at. I, you know, you can call them Ronnie's high fives if you want. Five areas that we have to focus on. Because we are all over the place. We are in Punka. We can't do everything. Can't be all things to all men and women. You have to have, and my general sector is always telling me this, discipline. Focus and discipline. That is what is required. You have a, a, a government that is not disciplined, not focused, all over the place. One minute is climate change, one minute is marijuana, one minute it is uh, tourism, next minute is islands off Barbados, next minute is higher, next minute is this, this, that, that. You open a pastry shop and you feel good? You know, they're cutting a ribbon for pastry in Lime Grove and you feel good, but then you're talking about healthy lifestyles. How do the two match? Climate change, climate change warrior, but you're going to destroy the reefs. How are the two matching? I am, I am responsible, but you burn all this money, though, and you ain't telling me what it for. Education reform, I care about you, but what are the details? 
All of these are things that we have to, they're problematic. So one of the five things that I believe Ronnie's high fives that we should focus on. First thing, economic diversification for long-term growth and well-paid jobs. That's kind of why I sketched out this afternoon, the direction that we could go in. Because we need money to run the country. People need money to run the households. You don't run on prayer. I believe in prayer, but everything can run by prayer. Yes, God pray and yes, God do. The, the prayer and work, they all go together. So that's one. What's the second thing that I would focus on? Entrepreneurial and technological revolution for shared, you hear that word I use in? Shared prosperity fell across Barbados. Not just prosperity for some, but for all. So the economic and the technological revolution has to be felt by you. Remember what I talked about earlier when I said, yeah, you got the books looking real good, but nobody can't feel that. So there has to be a connection between if the books look real good, you have to be feeling that revolution. You have to be feeling that prosperity. That's two. Second thing, a flexible education system that meets people I want to hear this? Meets people where they are. Not where you want them to be. Not where you're pulling them. Where they are. That's what education is supposed to do. Develop every single one of you as an individual because each of you are different. And we meet you where you are and develop you to allow you to access opportunities anywhere in the world. That is the point. That is what the education system has to do. Education for all. You can't leave school and not be able to read. That can't be right. Be failing you then. That means the education system is only catering for a select few. Because how do you get to leave high school and can't read? There had to be something going on in primary. What, what, went, what, what going on? Fourth thing, we are going to engage and embrace people's needs in all forms that they take. We have to create an inclusive and a wide and a big society that accepts and embraces people as they are all within the realms of the law and all within what is right. But we have to engage and embrace people in all forms, however they are. We have to. Whatever their disabilities, whatever their sexualities, whatever their genders, whatever their colors, whatever their classes, their creeds, whatever their intelligence, whatever they are, the Barbadian society has to say, you, I got a place here for you. You can be the best of you. It's the fourth. And the fifth, promotion and the protection of our environmental capital. Because if we run the country to the ground, we ain't got a way to live. And that doesn't mean flying about uh, to conferences and, and, and going to things. That means paying attention to the country that we live in. Paying attention to flood prevention me measures that actually work. That means hearing the farmers about where they've been getting, they been getting the water. That means why is all of our water running into the sea and not into the aquifers? How do you get it back into the aquifers? That means paying attention to the coral reefs that you allow to be destroyed. All of these are the things that we have to do. So we talk about environmental capital. That means paying attention to air quality. And not gimmicks, real, real things. How do you get communities involved in protecting their environmental capital? So these are the five things, my five commitments, Ronnie's high five, what do you want to call them, that I, as leader of this party, will put before these people. These are the five things that I focus in on. Because we can't do everything. So within there, we have economic development. We have entrepreneurship. We have education. We have social reform. We have inclusivity. And we have the environment. So every, the basics of a country will be covered and we build out on this. This, these things could easily fit into the philosophy of the Democratic Labour Party because they're part of it. 
Go back to that 1961-66 manifesto. They, they, exactly, they were straightforward, principled things. In a big, in a big barn and build the island, but they were they were so straightforward and so powerful that effects were big. And effects still felt no. That is what we need to create. Stop writing hundred page documents with a lot of dribble and gibberish and about understand we're talking about 2030 and this and we will become a, 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 a what do you call it? world advanced society. What does that mean? They things ain't got the meaning. If I tell you that I want to create economic diversification, I just sit on here set out for you, that got meaning. What, what, what was all these, these, these lofty ideas and that have no connection to reality? It might sound good and get your friends internationally, but that is not helping Barbados. So, ladies and gentlemen, you have to be the change. I'm going to end where I started. We talked about the fear, the climate of fear that seems to grip this country, where you cannot speak out, where you cannot offer sensible, reasonable, rational criticisms before you are punked upon. We had the intelligent ladies of the Democratic Labour Party last week in St. George offer what was valid critique of the Child Protection Bill. If there was anything that they said that was off color, they didn't curse nobody, they didn't call them, it just went through the bill. As, you know, you know what, actually, you know what they behaved like? They behave as if they were MPs. Because if they were in Parliament, that's what they would have to do. Section one, Mr. Speaker, well, I meant to say, you think about this? And, and that's the debate. That's what they did. Yeah. Critical, careful analysis of the law in Parliament. Yeah. That is what, as an opposition party, we're supposed to do. They did it. And rather than going, okay, okay, um, okay, uh, uh, ladies, okay, Democratic Labour Party, I take your point. I necessarily don't agree with you there, but I will see what we can do. Hey, man, come, the minister, all the and currency people. He let back. Talking about how the seeking the low road to off it. Okay, what? It made no sense. Because they are, they are sensitive to criticisms and for a government that has all, and I want y'all to recognize this, the government of Barbados does not have anything in its way to stop it from doing the things that it's doing. So every single decision from 2018 to now for the last five years, they have to own it. Every single one. There's nobody in Parliament said, well, you know the opposition party filibuster this. You know that they keep me up late at night and I'm delay the motion. We can't delay the motions in Parliament. We can't filibuster nobody. We can't do any of that. So they have to own it. These last five years of incompetence and dabbling and dibbling and, and everything, it is theirs. I recognize, as I said, I am not uncharitable. I understand, I recognize the foreign reserves have improved. I give them a take. But then I explain how they improve, which create other problems in other spaces. So they have to own this. Stop calling the Democratic Labour Party name. We've not been near the wheels of government for five years. We can't do nothing, but this is your government. Of it. Own it. Man up, woman up, whatever y'all got to do, take responsibility and stop trying to blame. You can believe that the minister. It's not. You can believe that he gets in Parliament and try to blame the Democratic Labour Party for the Child Protection Bill as if we move the bill. Oh, y'all do. The I'm like, but this is you, Bill. You sit there and draft this. We didn't even know what it was on television up in Parliament website. How it get me problem? We're just offering you proper criticisms of it. Everything that happened, or the Democratic Labour Party. The, the house is in bill, the Democrat. How we could build a house? In fact, we did build a house in this party. <laughs> so actually we did. 
So in five years, they can't get nothing built, but we could build one. In how, in how much? In a year? Less than a year? In less than a year, we could build one. They have five victims that they can't get houses for, but this is a party that is band together in the old-fashioned way and got one built. So take responsibility. That is five years, your fifth year anniversary, and maybe five years, you've become a little bit older and wiser. Take responsibility for your actions. Take responsibility for governing to the Barbados Labour Party and the government. That's, that's my advice to you. Own up. This is your government. All of it. In a way that no other government has had the opportunities. If there's no development in Barbados, it is you. There's no growth in Barbados, it is you. There's no constitutional, uh, a new constitution in terms of the Republic, it is you. You ain't got no ID cards, it is you. The buses ain't working, it is you. The clinics ain't working, you. The schools run down, you. Still can't get a symbol, you. All you. The garbage ain't collect, you. You can't even say that we were in the that we in the policy space affecting you, because we ha we can't. All of it belongs to you. So I want to end where I began, and I want to urge all Barbadians to reclaim the public space. You don't need to be neutral for nobody. If you got a point, you met your point, and then manner that is, you know, comports a good form in debate, how you move on? You don't got to try to hedge it. Well, you know, you just hear everybody writing. As yeah, the Prime Minister, is a very, every article got to begin with a praise. No, you don't got to praise anybody. If you point, if it ain't working, it ain't working. It's not simple. You don't got to massage the egos. If, 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 if your ego is so easily bruised, well, then maybe you should, that person shouldn't be in politics. Go and find a different profession. You got a job to do. So I would urge this party to continue to serve and to try to serve. We, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen what happens when we come together, when we bring logic and order and discipline to debates and contribute to public discourse. It has effect. We know we can do it and encourage us to continue to do it. I am most, most grateful for this opportunity to speak to the party, my party, and to speak to the country. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for this. Thank you. So I, I don't know, I'll take a few questions, um, if there are any. I, I didn't intend to really keep you uh, this long. <laughs> um, so I'll take a few, a few questions, uh, if there are any. Good afternoon, um, Comrade President. Good afternoon. Um, your presentation was well informed and well done. Um, I want to ask, what is your take on the recent, let's just say, backtracking of government contracts that seem to have magically disappeared? We would have heard Senator government center Chantel Monroe Knight hurriedly put in place a bill in a matter of short space of time and it was addressed in public spaces by myself and others but as usual other people in other spaces can run to the defense of this corrupt administration I want to know what is your take on it and because we have a right to know about these contracts that are should be there because the, the staff at Kaipo don't know anything they're very really aware of the changes that happened that took place in 2021 mm -hmm. the former minister of health didn't even know what was going on in his own house which is very sad mm -hmm. so I would like to know from you sir what is your stance what is the Democratic Labour Party stance on that thank you okay uh <clears throat> The Democratic Labour Party um, will have 
and has a zero tolerance policy um, and approach to corruption. Um, there is obviously room for uh, corruption and let's put it lack of transparency if the public is not made aware of the contracts as promised. We know that the IMF um, has stipulated this as part of the uh, conditionalities for their for their loans. They were supposed to have this register um, of yeah since 2021. Uh, we know that the government had passed the public procurement uh, act in 2021 as well. So these things are supposed to to be in place so that we can understand uh, the contracts that are being awarded for public works. We know that the former minister uh, Kado had talked about it. In fact, she promised. I think she was minister at that time. She's not now to publish these things, it has not been done. And we call strongly on the government to uh, honor its commitment, not only to the laws that they have passed, but to the very relationship with the IMF that they have. And importantly, most, most, most importantly, to the people of Barbados. If you want to talk about transparency, and you want to talk about uh, addressing corruption, you have to publish uh, the contracts. These things should be in the full public glare so we understand where government's money is being spent. Well, not even government, where our money is being spent because we pay the taxes. So I, 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 I issue a call for the government to get its house in order and get the register up and running. Uh, I'm sure that they have nothing to hide. <laughs> Mr. President, I, yeah. first let me congratulate you on a thorough presentation what I'm sad about, mm. and all the praise that I've just given you, is that there are 30 members in Parliament, mm -hmm. and not one, not one can address the issues that you have. That make me sad. Mm. For a person who has been going to Parliament since 1964, listening to debates, forget you reading of them, listening to debates, mm -hmm. and 30 members in Parliament and cannot even speak to the issues that you've just spoken of, it is sad. It is sad. Let's talk about deficits. I'm not an expert in this particular area, but I've read. In 1976, the Democratic Labour Party left government. The, the debt was $246 million. Mm -hmm. I said so at a meeting, and Frank, the late Frank, and I said, what? I said, yeah, but the foreign debt was only 60. You said, oh. <laughs> the point is that all in that $247 million, only $60 million was put to foreign entities. That mm -hmm. was the record of the Democratic Labour Party. And when you look from 1961, I can't help being historical because mm -hmm. the facts are there. Mm -hmm. From 1961 to 1976, mm -hmm. everybody here knows what progress was. Mm -hmm. You knew that. Yep. So I don't have to repeat that. But mm -hmm. that is all that we had only way. Now, in 1976, and by 1981, Tom Adams character won $1.2 billion. Mm. 1961, a budget, the budget in 1961 was only $25 million. Mm -hmm. But you know, by the time the Democrat Labour Party came into office, 4th of December 1961, there was a deficit of $1 million. Now, how was that $1 million created? 25 plus 1, because they had made increases in the civil servant salaries mm -hmm. of $1 million, and the Democrat, they borrowed for the money to pay. <laughs> and then you going to come along, you heard about people talking about a borrowed shirt, a borrowed pants, because things were open up. There was a crash program True. that opened up. People were getting $20 and a penny a week. Mm. But that $20 and a penny a week could have done so <clears> much in those days. I, I just had to say that because I was really enthused mm -hmm. by your presentation. And the fact that what made me get up and speak is when you made references to 61 and 66 manifesto of the Democratic <laughs> Party. Because we know what took place, mm -hmm. but we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yep. So Tony, people don't, don't go back. You have to go back. Unless anybody has got a crystal ball that can tell me what will happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen in the next 10 minutes. Mm. I don't understand the training. But we already know what has taken place. Mm -hmm. And believe you me, 
the performance of the Democratic Labour Party in a small developing country is still unchallenged today. Martin Fenn all said that, she will not be able to. Mm. She will not be able to. Enough said. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll just say one, one or two, and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up and allow you to uh, enjoy the, the lunch that you've also come here for. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I want to ask a question that I'm not sure if this is the right forum, but I'm going to ask. Um, can you briefly explain, even if not now, at a later date, when the possible touchdown for this IMF program will occur? Why am I asking that? Um, in my youth, we had an IMF program in 1980, and that, to me, lasted until 1992, three, when we had the 8% cut, that stretch, all the way down there. So now that we are having the, these in 2000, we started from 18, 2018, where is the possible touchdown for these? And I'm thinking of my great grandchildren that I don't have. Um, but that is a that is a good and a fair question. Actually, it was one when this uh, second round of IMF um, programs were entered into that a lot of us raised because it seems that now we are in a rolling IMF program, and I think it was the first time. It's the first time in the history, you're right, that there's no end point. So under both IMF programs, under uh, Tom Adams and Erskine Sandiford, they were very fixed. There was, there was a start and an end. This is the first time in the history of Barbados uh, under IMF program that we just, we don't know, we just roll in from program to program. Uh, there's, no, there's no fixed point, so it's a, it's a fair question. We just don't know. All right, I'll take one more and then uh, we'll wrap up. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a 23-year-old granddaughter, mm -hmm. and she, she, I have in my house we talk a lot of politics, but I was I was extremely proud this morning when she left her room and came out. She said, "Granny, she's 23 and she has a two-year-old," and she said, "Granny, you know." That boy, Ronnie Sweet, man. She said, <laughs> she said, I said, what do you mean by that? He's married. She said, she said, no. She said, he's bringing in those young people. And I mean, she was, she was so enthused with what was happening. She said, you can't take away um, parents' rights. Parents, yes, she agreed that children has rights as well. But you can't take away the parents' rights. Well, no, but she knows she couldn't take it away in my house. Cause I let them know this is mine. Here is mine. I buy this. I pay a mortgage for it. Thank God I ain't want a body for it. No. You understand? But she was so enthused. And that showed me that what you all are doing, it is the young people is aware and don't stop it. And, and bring those young people in different areas to talk about it, that is where you got to do, you got to talk. In, when, I, when I was heading the department at the hospital, and my, a lot of myself would say, but Miss Boys, you saying that all the time. I said, well, I ain't seen a change, so you got to say it. You understand? Mm -hmm. So you keep, keep on that line with so young people. That, that's how, that's how you, you win governments. Well, that's how I think. But things that the young people know, look, this will make a difference and that people will constantly hear because i hear people coming in my ears ronnie need to say this and he need to say that uh, every boy need to be saying it mm -hmm. and they, and these are things he say where are you when we are having meetings you understand you got everybody need 
to be saying it. And this inviting some of what we got to stop with that and come together. I do not, I cannot understand how intelligent people who been in politics all their lives do not understand that if you don't come together uh, and people see it, don't care what you do, we going got people telling people what happening, you know. So if we don't come together as a strong, unity is strength. It is strength. So we have to be saying the same thing. Yeah, we have disagreements even in our own home. But that does not mean that when you don't see me, I had 17 people marching against you and when the bell ring, all of them march back. B big men, big men, you know, we don't test because every one of them march back there. I, yeah, we need to I, I would, I would respond. What's that? What's that old saying? Um, um, tongue in, tongue in cheek. This got, this got, this got words. Tongue in cheek. This got words. Um, so look, you know, it is, and and this is this is just a, a little bit of a broad analysis here. A political party is really a assembly of varying interests. There'll be people who want different things. Somebody want to go in different direct, directions, different expectations. All expectations and directions can't be met. You have to compromise. There has to be a spirit to say, look, you know, as I said, these are the, I, I just listed the five things that we should focus on. I bet you before you leave here, someone said, but you forget this group, and you forget that, and you forget, and, but we can't, we can't do everything. And I think sometimes in our political space, we end up creating laundry lists. And then we don't get anything done. Because then by the way, you forget. And, for, and by the time you've got 100 things and nothing is done. Yeah, and we need to focus. Um, as I said, you know, uh, I think political scientist uh, Devron Bruce did an excellent bit of analysis that I saw in the paper yesterday of the losses, um, of the challenge that we face. I think he said it was 250% worse than the loss of the Barbados Labour Party in um, 1886. So we understand the challenges that we face. He reckons we need a bigger swing than the 86 and Barrow is the only person in the history of this party, not, not even David was able to achieve that swing uh, that is required if we are going to uh, even come close to, to recapturing, recapturing the government. There's a lot of work to be done, but I am hopeful, I am optimistic and enthused that we can get there. There's nothing that stops us. We can do this um, because, as I've said, and I'll say it again, change the party, change the country. And, and on that note, you are your best agents of change. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you and have a great weekend.